I am Matt Sump. I also have with me today Devin Glass, who will be doing the technical part of the presentation here. What's new in 2020 for Mastercam? So obviously this is part one of two webinars, but anything we can't cover, feel free to go to either the What's New Mastercam website, also the Mastercam forum if you get your account link there. There's um, always a couple good sticky posts where Ken and Dave and a couple of the other product managers at Mastercam will do kind of in-depth in webinars on a very specific topic. So like Devin will be talking about this new um, scallop tool path options that we have in 2020. And uh, Dave Canigliero from CNC has a about a 30 minute video going over all the different, you know, granular settings in there. And then you can always, always check out the Mastercam YouTube channel and they post up a lot of what's new videos and other useful content there as well. So just kind of giving a, kind of setting the stage before I pass it over to Devin is, you know, the goal of Mastercam every release is to essentially make you more efficient and faster at CNC programming. You know, not, not have it be a hurdle of your business, but rather a profit center and an area where, you know, you can essentially produce better quality parts faster and improve your manufacturing process. So a few ways that we've implemented that or focused on for the 2020 release is working with all the various partners. So that's either with the couple of our corporate employees that we call OEM liaisons that work directly with the machine tool manufacturers. Both of those guys are actually ex shopware employees, Chris, Chris Kozell and Dave Miller and Dave Miller is based out of Chicagoland here. And, you know, he goes around to all the OEMs and make sure they're set up with posts or can get feedback on our posts so that anything we deliver to you can be as close as possible. And then obviously getting into the, you know, just CNC programming, fine tuning. The cam market is pretty mature at this point. You know, it's not like the mid 90s where all of a sudden Mastercam can do 3D machining now. You know, 3D machining now has been out for 25 plus years. So it's really kind of finding those little features that can make your lives easier. And that being said, and I always harp on this in our in person rollouts, but any feedback you want to give us, you know, we're more than welcome to take it and either, you know, apply it to us as the reseller or send it up to Mastercam. So a lot of the changes you'll see in Mastercam are directly based on user feedback. One of the changes in 2020 that I believe Devin will cover, but I'm not 100% sure, is if you're copying geometry from one operation to another using the new 3D tool pass with the advanced um geometry selection, you now have an option for how much or if if you want the stock to leave values to propagate from one operation to another. Because a lot of people are saying, okay, I would drag this operation to a different set of geometry or vice versa, but then they would want different stock to leaves or maybe it was a semi-finished to a finished tool path and they wouldn't want any stock to leave on the subsequent one. And instead of having to go in there and reassign all their different machining groups, they can essentially just say, I don't want any stock to leave, even though I'm copying the geometry over. And that was a tip or a request sent in by a customer that's li literally across the street from the shopware office. So it's Always cool to see stuff like that get into the software based directly on our customers' feedback. So some other focus areas for Mastercam for this release is really just in what you know they call the job preparation or setup part of your file. So you know that's from Im importing geometry. You know the file merge has been improved for 2020. The um, planes and how planes are set up and viewed, you know, that's all what they consider under that job prep and setup bundle. So that's one area. And then getting into validation, because obviously uh, any key to a cam system is, you know, when you hit that post button, things are ready to go for the floor and you're not going back and forth from computer to machine and having to re 
set up everything every time you get a new part in. And then lastly, management and documentation on the files. So, you know, that's from setting up the setup sheets. But I believe that was all the slides I have. So I'm going to introduce Devin from, he works out of our Indiana office. And I will pass the presenter over to him. All right. Thanks, Matt. Uh, did you see my, uh, my slide here? Yep. Just making sure that everything's working. Okay. Um, so, uh, like Matt said, I uh, work in the Indiana office. If you've called in for tech support, there's a chance that you may have talked to me. Uh, I also do on-site training for both Indiana and Western Kentucky. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, you've probably worked with me before. So I hope uh, I hope I can do a good job here to show you some of the new stuff in 2020. Um, first things first, uh, before we jump into Mastercam itself, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. There's a little things that changed outside of Mastercam that I like to talk about. Um, First things first, uh, for those of you who installed 2020, you might have gotten a warning that said, hey, uh, your graphics driver does not support OpenCL 1.2 support. Um, that's a new addition to Mastercam 2020 is it's utilizing a feature in newer uh, graphics cards in attempt to speed up uh, dynamic tool path processing. Um, so like your dynamic mill, your OptiRough, and any kind of linking passes uh, for 3D tooling. Um, it's it's attempting to speed up. Um, but the reason why I want to bring it up here is because a lot of people see this warning that's saying that they don't have OpenCL, but they actually do. Um, a lot of times the simple fix to that is, whoop, the simple fix to that is literally just updating your graphics card drivers, which I've done multiple times for tech support. So you can update your graphics card drivers. If your graphics card does not support the OpenCL 1.2, you can just disable that warning altogether, and you're really not going to see any kind of slowdowns. It's just the potential of speeding things up. So um, it shouldn't be any different from 2019 if you don't have that feature on your graphics card. Um, if updating your graphics card drivers doesn't work and you're sure that that graphics card has that capability, um, you can search our knowledge base for troubleshooting or you can call into the office with the number below. Call us or email us and we can help you troubleshoot it if you have a maintenance uh, maintenance with us. Moving right along, another, uh, another outside Mastercam thing is, uh, for those of you who are running Mastercam and Mastercam for SolidWorks on the same computer, I got a few customers that I know that switches back and forth um, or they're using one coworker wants to use Mastercam SolidWorks, the other one wants to use Mastercam. Uh, there's a little bit of the file structure is a little bit different. You still have a My Mastercam 2020. Um, they've changed it from MyMCAM to My Mastercam. So now you have a Mastercam folder and a Mastercam SolidWorks folder in that folder. <laughs> and But here's where it becomes important is now the shared Mastercam 2020 is shared between both Mastercam and Mastercam for SolidWorks. So theoretically, let's say I call up our post department and say I want to make a minor edit to my post. Well, before, in 2019 and prior, you'd have to update that post in both Mastercam and Mastercam for SolidWorks. Now, if you do it in the shared folder, that covers both products. Once again, if, say, my coworker changed a tool in Mastercam for SolidWorks and I'm using Mastercam, theoretically, if once that updates on the server or on my computer, I could pull that in and it's pulling from the same location. So everything should be hunky dory there. Um, so everything's now on that one shared uh, folder. And before we hop into that presentation, I want to jump into Mastercam real quick. And here I got open Mastercam 2020. It's pretty, uh, pretty default here, but I'm going to just open up a little example file for now. And the first thing I'd like to talk about during this is the enhancements with the plain nomens. So in 2019, we introduced the ability to display multiple uh, plain nomens. So if I turn on display my plain nomen, I could say I want to display this plane. I want to display, of course, I can't read all these. So I want to display this, that, and that. So in 2019, we introduced the ability to display multiple nomens. So if I had like a different datums here and there and here and there. But what we can do now in 2020 is 
we can ha we have multiple options on how we display those. If they're large or smaller, if they show their um, plane. What I like the most from this uh, from this enhancement in particular is now you have the ability to actually go out and pick on the gnomon. So say for instance, I don't know in this list what I'm trying to find. I don't want to try to pick and try to grab whichever one's right. I can go over here and visibly see, oh, I want that datum. I can right click on it and then set it as my WCS. I can set it as my G view. I can set it as my C plane, T plane, section view, um, edit it, rename it, the whole nine yards, basically everything I can do in the planes manager, but now I can actually go out and click, right click on the gnomon and make my changes to it. Um, you can also see that it's displaying what it is, so I can visibly see on my part, oh, what's my WCS, what's my construction tool plane? Um, like, same here, if I set that in my construction tool plane, I can still see that my front dash one is my WCS, but my so, or slide plane dash three is my construction and tool plane. So, uh, quite a few added features there. Next, I'll go into another file here. So here I got a part, um, I got a part, and on a, another master cam file, I have the fixture I want to uh, clamp this on here. Of course, I want to bring that fixture into master cam so I can uh, better verify against it, make sure there's no collisions. So I'm going to go pull that file in. So I'll go into file, merge, and it turns out to be this Z chain guard base. Open that up. And here's my fixture. So before in 2019, we didn't have very many options when it came to positioning this part. Usually we would only have a way to position it. And then, um, actually, in fact, I even have 2019 right here. If I merge, say, This will do. This is all the options we had. So we had a scale, we had a position, um, a rotation, mirror, and set to the current attribute. So if it, whatever level's on. If I come back here, I can actually align it using all our model prep align functions, dynamic transform it, mirror it, scale it, just like in 2019. Um, I can tell it to go to a particular level. But for right now, I'll say I want to align it brings up the align to a face function, and I'll say I want it to be parallel. I want to move it, not copy it. And I'll say I want the inside of this cylinder. I got to give it an accent. So I'll say like from the center line here to the center line of there. Get that X axis going the right way. And then I'll click on this cylinder and do the same thing, center line or center point to center point. Now it's aligned. It's a little bit dug into the part just because we have a little counter bores. It's a little hard to see without the shading there. We have counter bores, so it's going to the bottom of this cylindrical face. But thankfully, I can click on the Z-axis uh, arrow here, pick a position on the bottom of that face, and now it's all aligned. And if there was additional geometry, I can select that additional geometry. I can hit the green check. It's in position. I'll say offset my levels by, say, 1,000. So if I were on, say, a level 1, it would be at 1,001. Um, but I could also say, you know, merge the file levels. Since this file came from, or this file came, is native to master cam, it, whatever level that, that uh, fixture was on, it would come in there. And I can tell it to set the main color line style, all this good stuff. Green check, and I got my fixture. So a lot of enhancements to file merge, just so you don't have to do it after the fact. It is nice to just be able to bring in the file and align everything. The next thing I want to talk about is going to use this file, but I'm actually going to take this fixture out of the equation because I've already made that fixture. Right there. So the next enhancements that we've done is on the push-pull functions. So if I go into model prep, push-pull, 
we now have the option of copy, which will create a brand new solid from nothing. And I'll show you, I'll show you a little more details on that. But first, I have this um, wireframe, this profile here. I could go into select chaining, chain this guy. You get a little spoiler on the uh, new chaining manager. Don't want to intimidate you. Chain that profile. And now the push pull can make a solid from nothing. Just from geometry or wireframe, I should say. Now, where this really comes in handy is, say, for this instance, we're trying to make a uh, a, a bushing to sit on this nut, so we can put apply pressure to the actual part as opposed to just screwing this bolt on to nothing. So, what I'll first do is I'll project this wireframe down onto this face. So I'll split solid faces, split this face. Shift click the geometry, so it's going to break this into two pieces. And then I could do push pull, copy instead of move, grab this face, bring it up, maybe bring it up to the bottom of that bolt. And I'll hit the blue check, and then I'll move it because I don't want to make a brand new solid. Shift click in here, fill that up. And now we have an entirely separate solid. So if I were to grab it, hit Alt E, there we go. Brand new solid from nothing. Pretty handy. I've used it quite a few times um, just on normal projects myself, especially when I just want to copy the solid instead of uh, changing the native solid. But those are just a few things that we did with the model prep functions or the push pull. Um, another thing you may have noticed while I was working here is, uh, and you may have noticed when you were working on 2020, since we got a few people who's already used 2020 so far, is when you click on a entity type, a new tools tab pops up. So now it has cherry picked a bunch of functions from different tabs. So you can see we have the hide on hide and the analyze functions from the home tab. We got some create functions from the solids tab, some modify from the solids tab. Uh, position from transform tab, uh, layout from the, uh, I believe that's also in the transform tab, scale from transform tab, shapes from the wireframe tab, curves from the wireframe tab, and smart dimension from the drafting tab. So you can see there it has solid selection. So since I have a solid selected, it's cherry picked functions that are commonly used with solids. If I unselect that and click on wireframe, same deal, but different functions, it's going to give me some tools here. And same goes for surfaces and, uh, and meshes. Uh, and just so you guys know, uh, these are customizable. So if I wanted to add a function when I'm ha when I have solid selected, it's the same place as if I were to edit any of them. Go into more commands. I hit the little drop down there. You could also hit file and options. Customize ribbon bar. And they're not a main tab, but it's a tool tab. Now, if, like me, your muscle memory is fighting you and uh, you just are getting, getting, you just want to go back to how it was in 2019, you can flat out turn these off. But I think they will pay huge dividends if you, if you fight that muscle memory for a few weeks. But you could come in here and say you want to add to the solid selection, you want to add to the mesh selection, you want to add to the surface selection. So if there's a function in that list that you commonly use, but it's not on there because it thinks it's not, not or doesn't or not default you can add it on there so very helpful next thing is just really small but um let's say i get this part off my screen here in the drafting tab we now have what's the whole table now a few of you guys may have used this but before it was a c hook so it was very limited in its ability just because it was only looking for wireframe. But now it's been integrated in with Mastercam fully. And if I hit whole table, I can now not only grab wireframe, but I can grab faces, I can grab edges, and I can grab an entire body. So if I turn these guys off just for simplicity's sake, and I click this whole body, I get a nice tool table. If I put this in the top view, nice tool table, uh, bleh, can't talk, <laughs> a nice tool table. So for right now, it's just saying, do I want to count? 
So there's four 16 millimeter holes and 30 or and one 30 millimeter hole. But I could also switch this to instead of count re locations relative to a position. So it's going to look at C plane, T plane, WCS, world, all that good stuff, um, and label them here. And another thing that it'll do is if I get this part in a good position, these bolts are unfortunately getting in the way a little bit, but that's all right. If I get this in position, if I scroll down, I can hit active reports, give it a second to load. And now we got a snapshot of our part alongside with a, uh, with a table of the diameter and the positions of each hole. So um, definitely helpful if you got someone on a proto track trying to manually put in the X, Y moves. Um, uh, well, that's a bad example because we have a proto track post. So, <laughs> but anyway, just in case you need those locations and you need them documented. So hop out of there. And I believe it's at this point I can go back to my presentation here because these are just kind of some honorable mentions and the design side of things. So uh, the Mastercam, Mastercam now supports single stroke true type fonts. Um, specifically, there is one that they've added uh, where it's kind of like Arial font, except it's now stick. Um, so you can get to that in either the create letters or the note. Um, now trim, break, and extend has been separated into separate parts. So um, it doesn't really show it in this pre presentation as well as I'd like it to. So let me just hop back over to this part. If I go to the wireframe tab here, you can see that if I go to trim entities, the little exacto knife up there, we have trim and break like usual. We have auto, trim one entity, trim two entity, trim three entities. We don't have trim to a point and we don't have extend or the extend option. Well, that's been broken out into two sections. So if I go under trim entities, I got trim to a point. That's where that function went. Um, and then we have modified links. So with modified links, we can say whether we want to lengthen or shorten and then we give it a distance. So same functionality, they've just been separated into different functions, just like they did with 2019 and with the trim, break, and extend and divide, delete. Um, so just keep an eye out for that. And last but not least, in the design side of things, um, which is a I'm super excited about because I think it could be very helpful for you for you guys is deleting referencing entities. So uh, I think we've all been in the situation where we've hit control all or we window around a section, we hit delete and we see this little message pop up. Everything below or everything above where my mouse is, if you can see my mouse, probably not. <laughs> um, but before then, uh, 2019 and before, when you delete a bunch of entities and this warning came up, it was basically telling you, hey, this this arc, this line, this solid is associated to something. Now that could be in turn a tool path, a solid or a plane, but we don't know. You'd have to then back out and try to figure out what is associated with what. Well, now we have a drop down where it shows us a list of what is associated, what, what entities are selected and what are associated to things. So it's only gonna show what's associated. So in this situation, in this uh, screenshot example, this line that I'm trying to delete or say a whole profile, um, this one line is connected to a 2D contour. So probably trying to do a chamfer on that edge or something. So it's from that list, I could go through and pick, okay, do I want to, do I want to delete this line? Maybe I want to delete five of these lines, but I don't want to delete this line because this line is important. You can go in there and remove them from the list uh, pretty easily. You can also do it analyzed. Um, and I, I believe uh, you can isolate it. So from all of what you have deleted, it'll isolate only what you are right clicking. So you know exactly which line is which. Um, so that's definitely, definitely pretty helpful. I've already, it's already helped me quite a few times when I'm deleting a bunch of stuff. But that's about it for the design stuff. There's a few more things. There's actually a lot, a lot of stuff that came out in 2020, a lot of small features that, um, a lot of small enhancements that Matt kind of mentioned back at the very beginning of the introduction. If you look at that what's new, it really just kind of lists them all down, but it would take too long for us to go through all of them. And, uh, but anywho, next we'll get into the milling side of things. So a couple of highlights here. Um, there's over a hundred changing improvements. Uh, dependency regeneration and new 3D tool paths and enhancements. Um, so 
uh, let's just jump right into it. So I'm going to hop out of the presentation and I'm going to open up a different file. So I'll go to this little chaining file. So this is just a nice complicated part we got here um, that we want to machine. First things first, if I wanted to say make a dynamic mill, you know this mint win window is still the same. This is where the new chaining manager comes into play. So for the wireframe folks, for the people who have been chaining with wireframe and is used to chain with wireframe, nothing has really changed functionality wise when it comes to uh, wireframe side of things. Uh, there's a few small minor additions, um, but other than that, it's just a different. It's just a facelift moving some of the functions around. So once again, muscle memory might be a, might be your nemesis for a week or two, uh, like has been for me with the partial chain here. But we still have full chain, partial chain, error window, polygon, point, area, line, or single vector. Um, the, the advantage to this here is now the start and end back in 2019, which was a little, uh, little hard to find. So if I went to analyze chain, this is what the old UI used to look like. It, nothing wrong with it, just a little bit on the older side. Um, but in order to get to the start and exit, you'd have to hit this drop-down dialog that, unless you probably went through a class with us, you probably didn't discover on your own. Um, I know I didn't. Uh, the start and end was located here. But in 2020, now that's just built into the UI and it's nice and compact. Same functionalities there. Uh, something I was super excited about was the ability to, if I hop out and draw, say, a rectangle, there's no wireframe on this part, unfortunately, so uh, make that a different color so it's easier to see. There we go. And wire home, analyze chain. So if I chain around this part, or say I did a partial, partial chain from here to here, I can actually go back with the red arrow. So I can go back one and follow it along. So if you can imagine, if this had a bunch of branch points, real quick, I'll do that, transform, translate, join, down Z of negative two inches. So I think we've all been in this situation where we're chaining something that has all kinds of branch points, and when I'm chaining it, I hit this, and it says, well, do you want to go this way or do you want to go down? And I would probably say, yes, yes, and maybe I take a right turn or left turn at Albuquerque and I go down. Oh crap. In 2019 and before you'd have to stop and start all over. In 2020, they've added the previous so I can back up one, which is definitely uh, helpful. <laughs> so that's the, that's one of the big things there. But what they really did a number on is not the wireframe chaining, but the solid chaining. And this might look a little bit different than it did in uh, 2019 with a few similarities. I just kind of want to walk through these real quick. So loop is still the same. Uh, you grab the top face or you grab uh, an edge and it'll try to run a loop around a face. But now we don't have linked edge or we don't have linked edges um, and we don't have edges. We, we just have plain old edges here. So if I have this set to edges and I'm like say chaining around this profile before it didn't understand if I grab this edge and this edge, it didn't understand, oh, this is now one chain and just keep on carrying through. Now, if I said grab this edge and then grab said this edge, it understands, oh, those are two separate chains now because they're not linked in any way. So if I just keep building off that same edge, then it's gonna be contained into one chain. So it's kind of a combination of two of the two of the or chaining options in previous versions of solid chaining. So that's definitely helpful. You can um, you can hold the shift key, and there's nothing tangent there, of course. But if I hold the shift key here, it will follow tangency until it hits a sharp corner, which you can set a tolerance for in the auto cursor options right here, a tangency tolerance, because sometimes um, 
you can be a little loose about what is considered tangent or not. So if you're trying to get around this corner or something, you could probably try bumping that up and it will do, or try to go around there with the shift key. So loop is the same, partial loop is pretty much the same, yeah. Uh, you got face, but the real uh, winners here are these four new features that they've added. Uh, the first one is open edges. So if I click on, say, this blue face here with open edges, it puts a chain on every open edge. It says it advertised. So while it won't be great for what I'm doing right here, a machining region, uh, it would be fantastic for, say, a chamfer because I want to chamfer all these open edges. So if I zoom in real close, you can see it didn't bother grabbing that end. So pretty nice. I'll unselect that one for now. I'll actually unselect all of them. Next, on the, next we have is outer edges. So if I say outer edges and I grab this face, it grabs the whole outer edge of that face there. So it didn't grab these edges like it normally would if we just set face. Because just to give you a little refresher, if I had to set the face, it would also grab everything inside as well, which is not what I want for a machine region. So in this situation, outer edges would be perfect for my machining regions. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, let's save the last two for, say, the avoidance region. So the outer edge works here. So I'll hit the green check. I'll go into the avoidance regions. And here, I want to avoid these bosses, because if I preview the chains, you can see there, it's going to hit those bosses with the red and black lines there. So I go into my avoidance region, and I say, bosses. So now if I click on a face, it's going to grab every, every edge that's considered a boss. So if I clicked on that blue face, you can see it grabbed these, the bottom of these islands here. Definitely helpful. Green check. And if I preview the chains again, get this window out of my way, you can see here, put it in top view so it's easier to see. You can see here, it's now avoiding these areas here. Now let's say if I had that set to stay inside, like I originally have it, preview chains. Now I wanna tell it that it's okay to exit this part because you can see here, you know, there's a lot of open areas that it's okay to move that mill off of. So what I can do is I could say air regions, go back to op or open edges, click on that face. That's also another addition to 2020 is you can now have multiple air regions, green check, preview chains, and voila. Now, I just want to remind you guys, if you see the air region clipping, say, a boss like this, you don't need to worry. The air region is drawn based on your largest tool uh, that you have loaded, and uh, it's not going to get out that far most of the time. It's going to stay as close to that machine region as possibly can. The only time it would go into that air region and get super far out is because it thinks it needs to, which nine times out of ten it's not going to do. And the last one I didn't get to cover here is the fact, or the, um, the cavities. Now, let's say, for instance, this is the opposite, basically, of bosses. If I click on the top face, it shouldn't grab the outside, but it should grab the inside of those two holes. So you can see there, it grabbed the inside of those two holes. So cavities is going to grab everything that's not necessarily a boss. It's the opposite of a boss, basically. Another thing I like to talk about here is if we go into a solid chain here, say what, let's do this. I'll grab a face, okay? So I grab the face of this top boss here. But I go back in there and I say, well, I don't want those holes after the fact. Well, before, if you had a face, you're kind of stuck with it. You'd have to rechain the whole thing. Well, now I can right click on that face and I can downgrade it to either loops or edges. So I might just downgrade it to loops. And now they're separated into three separate loops that I can go in and delete. So if I right click on this loop, I could delete it. 
And now I can get very specific about what I want just by, you know, clicking the entire face and going in and changing it after the fact. So if I were to program this guy again, it would take me, uh, let's just, for demonstration's sake here, I'll just start over. Machine region. Outer edges. And then avoidance. Bosses. And then air. Outer edges. Green check. Pretty much got all my, uh, all my chaining done in probably under, I don't know, 10, 20 seconds. And, you know, do your normal parameters, all that good stuff, all your linking. Green check. Let it generate. And voila, you got a functional toolpath right there. So a lot of nice features added to the solid chaining. That's definitely uh, a, a lot of a lot of work went into that side of things. So we'll just go ahead and move right along. Next thing I'd like to talk about is the dependencies button. Um, let me switch back to my presentation here real quick. So there's now a new button in the Toolpath Manager that you may have noticed. That is the dependencies button. Uh, and when it's turned on, depending on what mode you have it set to, selection or regeneration, let's say in the example you have a roughing operation, then a semi-rough, and then a finishing rough that's all looking at the previous operation. So the, the semi-rough is looking at the rough, the finish is looking at the semi-finish, or semi-rough, however you say, however you want to put it. If you have this turned on, you have it set to selection. If you grab one of them, it grabs all three. If you have it set to regeneration, if you regenerate one of them, it regenerates all three. So let's say I brought in a file and 50 toolpaths are dirty, but I'm only working in one section, but I need the parents and the children of those operations to regenerate at the same time. Now you just select one of them or regenerate one of them and it will get the rest. Um, so that also works for transform ops. So if you have, say, a transform op that's looking at five of them, uh, if you regenerate the transform, it should regenerate the the uh, the operations it's looking at. So now with the helix four thread mill and circle mill, before when you grabbed a circle on the screen, you were locked to whatever the diameter was. So you'd have to hop out of the toolpath and then change the diameter. But now, if you set override geometry diameter, you could say instead of that quarter inch hold, it's uh, say three eighths, um, and you don't have to rechange the geometry. You just have to change the diameter in here. So now we get to talk about the new drill hole definitions, and there's uh, there's another thing that happened to this that we're going to talk about here in a little bit, but. In 2019, when you grabbed, say, a circle or an arc, uh, if you grabbed a edge, if you grabbed a uh, feature, it would just say 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. So it was really hard to determine what was what without clicking on it and seeing on the screen what it was, or what was highlighted. But now, it will tell you what entity type you selected and what size it is if it has a size to it. So as you can see, the line doesn't necessarily have a diameter to it, but with an arc or, or a solid arc, It'll number it and also give you a diameter. So then I could go in and see right in the list what is what and what I need to get rid of if I grab too much. Um, so now we're going to get into the 3D side of things. I'm going to hop out of the slideshow here. I'm going to bring up this blend file. So with 2020, they've added a new blend toolpath. Here's an example part. If you look under the 3D section, you'll see blend. Looks just like it did back in 2019. But it's now part of the high-speed toolpath family there. So now it has multi-threading and it has all the features that all the other high-speed steel toolpaths have. So now you have a lot more control with payment regions. It's a part of the new UI. So now you have a lot more usability. So you can see here, for this first blend, they just blended between this or this profile and this profile. 
actually I'll turn on that. So you can see here, it's just going up and down that profile, blending between this profile to this profile. Here's another example of it in action. Blending down this prof or blending between the two profiles down this edge. See it in this section here. Now, I'm just gonna warn you right off the bat, currently, um, currently, this toolpath does not have 3D support. Um, this new blend doesn't. So you can see here on this blend, it's not doing really great in steep areas because it's only looking for a step over in X and Y. Um, if we were to compare this with the old style blend, the old blend toolpath, you can see now it's a lot smoother. And that is because when we go into the parameters of blend, cut parameters, it is locked to 2D. This one was one of the last ed additions to 2020, and they thought that it would be better to just send it out with 20, or 2D rather than waiting till the next version and send it out with 2D and 3D. So if you need that 3D style path like you had before, you could get to that toolpath by right clicking, going to mill toolpath, and finding uh, the surface high speed blend there. And that'll get you to the old version that will have the 3D switch there. But that will be added in uh, 20, 2021. So. so that's the blend toolpath in a nutshell. Next is something we're really excited about, and that is you can now use curves for the scallop toolpath, kind of what um, Matt was talking about towards the start of this presentation. So this is a part that, uh, that someone drew up here. And they're trying to toolpath it with a scallop toolpath. As you can see, it's starting in the center or starting the outside and working its way to the center. Not really that great. You can see it's collapsing on itself all throughout. But now with this toolpath, we get a nice kind of flow line look to it where it's following the profile of this surface kind of. And what it's really following is this profile that was drawn on the bottom of those fillets. So in Scallop, we now have the ability in the toolpath control to add curves. And that kind of gives it a profile shape to stay with. Now, the possibilities on this toolpath are, or with this addition are kind of uh, enormous. Uh, you can see here that we've pretty much got a path that I would, I would definitely approve on that's kind of flowing throughout the entire profile. The only downside is that it's jumping up on these walls, but that's just because you're undercut, which a three to five uh, toolpath conversion, uh, convert to five, fixes that right up by tilting the tool. So there's a file that has all kinds of examples here so someone sat down and made 74 toolpaths going through the different kinds of examples here. So let me turn on all the levels here. So you can see they had a little fun with it. So you can see in this example, they have a containment, containment boundary in the teal. They have a line that they've chained for the curve. And this is called closed so they've added this to help create the profile but it's still trying to turn into this rectangle on the outside so you can see here it's kind of collapsing in on itself because it's trying to blend into the shape of this rectangle this final shape but if we go to the trimmed version you can see here it doesn't care where it hits this rectangle it's just going to come up move over to the next cut and then start cutting again. It's not gonna try to do a closed loop at the very end. That's the main difference. If I go into the parameters here, in toolpath control, we have trimmed and closed offsets. So what we recommend usually is when you're first starting out with playing with the curves, set it to trimmed offsets because a lot of times when you're trying to get a path, sort of like the part we saw before, trimmed offsets the way to go or else it's gonna try to blend into that new rectangle. Well, while I'm in here, another thing I'd like to bring up is now with all the high-speed tool or high-speed 
toolpath um, in the uh, 3D side of things, we now have include silhouette boundary. So with that guide check, um, it will take the machining regions, make a silhouette boundary of it in the background, and use that as our containment region. So uh, definitely save your time in making that geometry manually. Um, but just another addition I wanted to bring up there. So the, the the possibilities on this is endless. I know there's one example here that I like to look at where it's they took they took a polygon and a heel or they took a polygon and a circle, just kind of mix them in between there, and you can see it's trying to maintain that shape and branch out and just echo that shape outwards. So definitely can control it a lot more and get a lot more uh, I guess control on it. So uh, moving right along, move right along. As Matt was mentioning, you can right click and drag the parameters over. I think I have a better picture of that on my presentation here. So here's another just example of the closed versus trims offsets in case uh, you want to see a better picture of it in case you couldn't see that. Or this is the version of closed. So you can see here it's starting with this arc and then it's echoing out until it gets and blends into a rectangle. And then we have our trimmed where it doesn't matter where it hits the end rectangle. It's just going to link up or wrap it up and move over to the next cut and just keep on going. So it's not going to, it's only going to use that curve to uh, determine the shape of the tool path. And like uh, Matt was saying before, you can right click and drag the geometry of a 3D tool path to a 3D tool path and now have a lot more control on what does it take with it, stock to leave values, replace or yeah basically stock the leave values and as a replace it for everything um, a couple of simulator things I just want to talk about real quick um, in the back plot you it now shows pecking um, I know there's a few customers we have that do a lot of drilling and that might get a little tedious uh, if you go into the configuration the simulation you could check it to skip drill cycle pecking so if you wanted to go back to where it just shows the tool coming in and out, you can check that box. Um, another couple things just for the simulator is Verify will now use Mastercam colors. So if you have your solid draw or a certain color, that's what it's going to come in as in the Verify. And it will also uh, translate, or the stock model colors will also go into the Verify. So if your stock model is purple, it'll be purple in the uh, in the verify. Oh, looks like that's a little early. We still got one more thing to talk about. <laughs> um, last thing I want to talk about here is probably the biggest change for you guys using multi-axis, and that is the five-axis drill. Now, I got a, I got a random part here that I would want to do five axis part. We've probably seen it if you've been through the Indiana classes and the multi-axis class. Um, but you may have noticed in the multi-axis section, we don't have a drill anymore. We also don't have a circle mill anymore. Uh, the reason that is, is because now we have integrated that, that, uh, that tool path into the 2D drill. So, you know, first thing I might do is I'll go into the drill, asking for features. I'll click the inside of the cylinder, or I could control click and I'll grab every diameter and hold the control key, click. So now no longer, or now it's also grabbing not only the diameter, but it's also grabbing a vector. So you, these arrows should look very familiar to you guys who are using the five axis drill. Give it a green check. Now give it a tool. I got an eighth inch drill that I loaded up here just a minute ago. Um, Cut parameters still looking the same. It's pretty much 2D drill, except now there's a new page called the tool axis control page. And currently it's outputting out at three axis, but I could also switch it to four or five axis. And that's literally all there is to it to making this a multi-axis tool path. Now, for those of you who don't have multi -axis, a multi-axis license, um, I believe it will still let you see these options, but once you click on, say, five axis, it'll hop back over to three axis, unless they've changed that since a patch. Um, but it will not let you actually select a four or five axis. So, and you'll notice that this tool axis control is grayed out. That's because it was able to determine the tool vector from the features we selected. 
Um, so since we select the inside cylinders and it was able to determine a vector, we don't need to come in after the fact and say, well, it needs to say, it needs to follow this or it needs to follow this line. And in a minute here, for those of you who prefer using wireframe instead of features, I'll show you, it's pretty much the same pro or, uh, process. I just don't create the points that I normally do. So anyway, back on topic. We now have limits in the 2D drill. Linking parameters are pretty much the same, but if, once you set it to five axis, um, all these get locked into incremental. And it's looking at the top and the bottom of the hole for the zero. So the top of stock zero is off the top of the hole. The depth is the uh, based off the bottom of the hole, but we can tell it to calculate the depth from the top of the line of the hole. So um, once again, if you guys are familiar with mo or five axis drill from the previous versions, same concepts. And we have a safety zone in here. So if I was trying to stay away from a certain area or if I wanted to stay outside the center, I didn't want to do any rapiding in there, I could create a safety zone in that cylinder. So that's pretty much it. I green check and I got a five axis tool or multi axis tool path. Now, for you guys who are used to um, creating geometry and then working off of that, or creating those using whole axis, it's the same exact process, whole axis, control click, and maybe reverse all those. There we go. But I just don't tell it to create the points because what ends up happening is when I window around those lines, um, it also grabs the points. So it thinks it's doing two holes at the same time and half of those holes don't have a vector to it. So I tell it, you know, don't make the point so it doesn't get confused when I'm grabbing a line and a point. Green check. And now if I do another drill, I should be able to window around those lines. Now I'll grab that point there. I can come in here and believe that is this guy. Delete. Oh, I'm sorry. I grabbed the solid features. Here's another way we could do it. We could either say, only lines or select all lines, and there we go. Same exact process. Now, this is not only for the drill. This also works for circle mill, helix bore, and thread mill. Before, it was a huge pain to do multi-axis thread milling because you'd have to make a plane in three plus two at every single hole. Now, the thread mill has that exact same functionality where I can come in here, control, click on the inside of this hole, and now it's multi-axis. Now, all the hole making operations have the ability to do multi-axis here. I'm excluding the FPM drill and the auto drill there. Oop, I didn't set it to multi-axis. That might help. I didn't spend any time making the threads or anything, so that doesn't look too great. But anywho, that's just because I'm being lazy with my tooling. But that is about it. And I will bring up the presentation one last time. If you have any questions, you can ask it now. Um, and you can also find this information on the What's New Mastercam. There's definitely a lot more there that we didn't get to cover today. Um, and there's also the forum for help in case you have any problems. You can also go to our, uh, go to the YouTube page for Mastercam corporate site. Thanks a lot, Devin. That was great. So again, I want to thank everybody for your time. And hopefully we'll see some of you at the second part of the this rollout webinar series in a couple weeks. But otherwise, everybody have a wonderful day, and we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks. Thanks, guys.